I'm pleased to share the opportunity to talk with Professor Nick Turner of the University of Manchester, England, the recipient of the 2018 ACS Catalysis Lectureship for the Advancement of Catalytic Science. The lectureship recognizes Professor Turner's contributions to biocatalysis and enzymology and is jointly sponsored by the journal ACS Catalysis and the ACS Division of Catalysis Science and Technology. Nick is being recognized for his contributions to the engineering of enzymes to catalyze an array of transformations of interest to both industrial and academic scientists, such as biocatalytic reductive amination or alcohol to amine conversion using hydrogen borrowing cascades, among others. Congratulations, Nick, on being selected as the winner of the 2018 ACS Catalysis Lectureship. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate this award from the American Chemical Society and ACS Catalysis and also for the opportunity to make this video today. A key theme in your research has been the development of enzymes and concepts for the synthesis of optically pure amines. Please speak about some of the challenges of such transformations as well as the importance of such compounds in chemical synthesis. So maybe I can tell you a, a little story. Um, about 20 years ago, uh, we had a very nice collaboration with scientists at Glaxo Glaxo Welcome, as it was in those days before they became Glaxo Smith Klein, and we were discussing with them sort of opportunities in biocatalysis, and they started to tell us this story that about 40 to 50 percent of the compounds that went through chemical development in Glaxo were chiral amines, including amino acids, which obviously are quite a sort of um, substantial part of that. So they said, if you really want to develop technology that has major impact in biocatalysis across a broad range of pharmaceuticals, then focus or at least think about new opportunities in chiral amines. So this is the late um, 1990s, 20 years ago. Um, at that time, if you wanted to make a chiral amine, I would say most of them were made by resolution of racemates, and obviously the industry was looking for asymmetric methods rather than resolution-based methods. In terms of biocatalysis, there were, people were mainly using lipases and esterases to do resolutions. There was a little bit of work on transaminase, but a lot of that was covered by patents, so there wasn't freedom to operate. Anyway, we took that on board, and we started to work firstly on an enzyme called monoamine oxidase, which is the first enzyme really we engineered through directed evolution. And in fact, I added up the other day, I think we've published 50 papers on that one enzyme. It turned out to be our first foray and venture into directed evolution, but it turned out also to be an enzyme that was highly evolvable, and so we rapidly generated variants that we could use for practical applications. That enzyme has been subsequently used by many other groups around the world. It's been used by industry in practical manufacturing processes, so it's been a sort of fantastic enzyme for our group. Then we moved on to other enzymes. We started to work with transaminases like a number of groups around the world. And more recently, we've developed um, imine reductases and reductive aminases in the last five years. So we've, you're absolutely right, we've had this as a sort of major theme in our research group. Uh, amines are not just important, I would say, just in terms of pharmaceuticals, but, but they're everywhere. They're ubiquitous chemicals. They're monomers for polymers, hexamethyl diamine, they're solvents, some very simple amines, they're adhesives, they're surface coatings, et cetera, et cetera. And I think one of the real challenges for biocatalysis, which is used now very heavily for making chiral amines for pharmaceuticals, is can it also be used for making lower value bulk or specialty amines? And we have collaborations in that space now as well. In 2013, you published a highly cited commentary on biocatalytic retrosynthesis, guiding synthetic chemists in their thinking about the application of enzymes in chemical synthesis. What were some of the most important messages from that work, and how have the suggestions or guidelines evolved in the last five years? I can tell you firstly why I rewrote that uh, paper. I was giving an undergraduate course uh, at Manchester, and it was the last course for the final year uh, graduates. And one of the students came to me at the end, and she said to me, and I remember distinctly, she said to me, you've just told us all about biocatalysis and biocatalytic retrosynthesis and why it's important and how we should be using it in our studies, but it's the last thing we've heard as we're about to graduate. Why, why, if it's so important, why isn't it sort of more integrated into the chemistry course? So I really thought about that, and we decided, let's start this whole sort of, you know, debate about the importance of biocatalysis in synthesis and retrosynthesis. So we 
decided to write this paper slightly nervously, I would say, because I wasn't quite sure what the reaction would be from the chemical community, whether a lot of people would say that's obvious. You know, it's obvious that biocatalysis needs elements of retrosynthesis. But I would say that it's been very well received, uh, particularly from industry, because I think they value that sort of um, approach, but also from academics. Um, fast forwarding, we've just written a book actually on biocatalytic retrosynthesis which was published in February uh, with a colleague in Gilead Pharmaceuticals um, and we've also written a review last year with Eric Carrera who's one of the world's foremost synthetic organic chemists where we've combined chemical retrosynthesis and biocatalytic retrosynthesis. So I think five years after that commentary which we published in Nature Chemical Biology it's now much more embedded in people's language. People cite that paper, which is very nice of them. They don't have to cite the paper, but they also use the language of biocatalytic retrosynthesis in their papers. But I still think we've got a long way to go to get it embedded into undergraduate teaching. Under biocatalysis is still largely taught as a sort of, um, if all else fails, try biocatalysis type of approach. And when you talk to people around the world, um, there is this sort of desire, I think, to get it much more integrated into mainstream chemistry. And until you do that, I think it will still be regarded as a sort of slightly niche um, approach. Recently, you've given significant thought into where biocatalysis will move as a discipline in the forthcoming years. How do you see the field developing, especially in regard to impacting the pharmaceutical industry? So I think, Chris, if you look at biocatalysis, historically it's been, certainly in the pharmaceutical industry, it's been used as a process technology. So it's basically a very good way of making uh, pharmaceuticals or building blocks or intermediates on large scale. A lot of companies like Pfizer, Merck, uh, GSK, when they develop second generation manufacturing processes, they will often switch the route to biocatalysis because they get a lot of benefits in terms of uh, lower cost of goods, improved uh, safety regimes, uh, alternative solvent usage, uh, lower impurity profiles, and essentially it's, it's a way of making a, an established drug more cheaply. However, I would say what we've picked up in the last certainly five years is there's a desire, I think, perhaps to go upstream with biocatalysis and use it more as a tool for discovery. And I think that's a consequence of a number of sort of technological developments, there, compared to 10 years ago, there are way, way more enzymes available now for chemists to screen. And they can be screened in a very sort of easy 96-well format. Um, 10 years ago, there just weren't the range of enzymes available to, for, for, say, discovery chemists to use. But that's changed. So transaminases, ketoreductases, amine oxidases, aldolases can all be now purchased very, very cheaply and screened in sort of high throughput format. There's a need um, for what people like uh, Merck will call speed in the pharmaceutical industry. So I think this idea of quickly and rapidly finding a biocatalyst and then rapidly optimizing it for the molecule of interest is very, very attractive and something that is now becoming competitive with chemocatalysis. Historically, again, biocatalysis, I think, took too long for the pharmaceutical industry to sort of develop. So. They might find an enzyme, but it might then take them another year to optimize that enzyme, by which time the chemistry had probably overtaken and beaten the biocatalysis. A lot of these companies like Merck and Pfizer are really gearing up now with high throughput protein engineering screening facilities so they can find enzymes quickly because there are so many more starting points. And probably more importantly, they can rapidly evolve those enzymes so that they're fit for purpose. So we've in fact written this article recently with colleagues from those two companies where we've tried to crystal ball gaze, I would say, you know, what, imagine what life is going to be like in five or ten years' time. This field is moving so quickly. The phrase I use is we're in, we're in the golden age of biocatalysis. It, compa even compared to ten years ago, the rate at which we find new enzymes, uh, find out what they do, optimise them, etc., etc., all the techniques that are available now, means that it's getting faster and faster. And we've certainly not, I would say, reached the maximum rate at which this can happen. So I think that the pharmaceutical industry has got quite so sort of high ambitions for where biocatalysis can be applied. Some companies will tell you that 
maybe one day 50% of their processes might be operated using some sort of biocatalytic step, which seems to me quite high, but that's the sort of a level of ambition I think that's out there. Historically speaking, researchers in biocatalysis and enzymology have only occasionally published in catalysis journals. Yet since the launch of ACS Catalysis, you have co-authored a dozen papers that have appeared in the journal. Do you see value in publishing your work alongside research done by practitioners of homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis? Absolutely, Chris. Um, and incidentally, we're very proud of the fact we published in the first uh, year of ACS Catalysis, so we've been in there with you uh, from the very beginning. But if I'm honest, when, when I first looked at ACS Catalysis, homogeneous catalysis and organic catalysis, that's fine. I, I have a, a working understanding of that. When I saw a lot of the papers on heterogeneous catalysis, I must admit that I thought, well, maybe that's not quite the sort of field I'm in. One thing that's happened in the UK, which is very interesting, is we've, um, we have something called the UK Catalysis Hub, and which I'm sure you've heard of, and that is uh, very much based around heterogeneous catalysis. And in the last few years, we've been having joint meetings, which we've been invited to, so we brought in a fifth theme in biocatalysis to complement the existing first four themes. And when I first joined those meetings, so this is methane oxidation, this is gold catalysis, this is not the sort of chemistry that I normally think about, and it's taken me and my colleagues quite a while to sort of, you know, find a, some common areas of interest with the heterogeneous catalysis group. But I think that is, you know, everybody gets inspiration from something particularly something that's outside of their main area of activity. And I think the Catalysis Hub and your journal are really breaking down the barriers between particularly heterogeneous catalysis and what I would call homogeneous catalysis, including biocatalysis. So I think there are a lot of opportunities, and you, get, you spot these opportunities by going to these conferences and reading journals like yours, where you inadvertently trip over from your paper to a paper on methane oxidation and you start to think about something you wouldn't normally have thought about. One of your recent papers in ACS Catalysis employed a one-pot biocatalytic cascade for the synthesis of papyridines and pyrrolidines. The development of artificial catalytic cascades for chemical synthesis is now being explored in all areas of catalysis, biological, homogeneous, and heterogeneous. What are some of the challenges that excite or intrigue you in the development of biocatalytic or combined bio and chemocatalytic cascades? If you think about the way nature makes molecules, everything is a cascade. So nature only uses catalysts, which is quite remarkable in its own right, because it uses enzymes. It puts together multiple transformations to go from simple starter materials to complex natural products. Everything is done pretty much under the same conditions in water, at near neutral pH. So even if you just think about cascade reactions just for a little while, you realize that for biocatalysis it's a massive and obvious opportunity because all you're really trying to do is emulate nature. You're, you're right, it's, come, it's, it's a very popular sort of area in a lot of other fields, but if you compare, say, conventional organic chemistry, you might have to switch solvents, you might have to, probably are going to have to switch temperatures from refluxing toluene to minus 78. So the range of conditions that you need to use is much more challenging to develop cascades, whereas in nature we're very, very fortunate. We have this gift, which is a suite of catalysts that essentially all operate under the same conditions. So we published this paper in ACS Catalysis. Again, we're very proud of that paper because it gets very highly cited, and I think it's a really nice paper where we showed you could make chiral preparadines by uh, putting enzymes together. An interesting, another interesting story, just after we published that cascade, a few months afterwards, a paper appeared in ACS Synthetic Biology from a Chinese group who found that cascade in nature. And I include this slide in my talk now. So we built it, we imagined it, we constructed it, we executed it in the lab, and then a few months later somebody found it uh, in a streptomyces. And so the question is, you know, nature got there first by a few million years, but it takes quite a while to, to discover these things in nature. It's not easy to find the entire open reading frame to identify all of the substrates, the products, the enzymes. So my prediction, and you're seeing this, is we will get better and better at, at creating cascades in the laboratory before they're found in nature. 
because as synthetic chemists we can uh, design, uh, think about what a cascade might look like, build it, engineer the enzymes, and you know it may well be that they're out there, but it takes quite a while to find these cascades naturally. And I think biocatalysis is is a is a technology that naturally sits very well with cascade reactions. Was there any hint or indication that? your work on the synthetic cascade had helped them rationalize no, some of the think, things they were seeing, or was it totally independent? I think totally independent. And the only, and the, well, the reason I have spotted the paper is they were kind enough to reference our paper in ACS Catalysis, which was very nice of them. Um, and if you look at it, it's not absolutely identical, but it's basically the same. The, the three enzymes we used are essentially the three enzymes they used with some subtle differences. But I think the point is that um, you know, we as synthetic chemists, and that's, this is what we do, we can try to imagine what cascades we might want to develop, and then maybe they're already out there, but maybe they haven't been discovered. Prior to enrolling in the University of Bristol as a teenager, did you envision yourself becoming a chemist, or did you have other aspirations? What ultimately drew you to study chemistry, and eventually to the study of biocatalysis and enzymology? I think when I was at school, I always had a strong interest in natural history. So not really chemistry, but more natural sciences. Incidentally, I grew up very close to where Charles Darwin lived, in Down in Kent. And in the summer, I used to go to Down House, which was where he spent many of his years. Charles Darwin was an incredible natural scientist. People often say about Charles Darwin that even if he hadn't have um, written The Origin of the Species, he still would have been one of the greatest scientists who ever lived. If you go to Down House, you, uh, you can learn that he, he worked on pollination of flowers. He had something in his garden called a worm stone, where he monitored the level of his lawn uh, every summer because it changed because of the, uh, the activity of the worms in the soil. So he was clearly somebody who had a broad sort of uh, interest in natural sciences, but obviously he became famous for, for evolution, natural selection, which is an area that we've ended up working in as, 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 as synthetic chemists in directed evolution. So I had this background and interest in natural history, natural sciences. I went to Bristol to study chemistry. I actually got very interested in geology and almost switched and then got a very good piece of career advice from my tutor, which is that if you want a job, stay in chemistry. Geology is not so easy, maybe in the oil industry. I kept going with chemistry and then like all of us I got influenced by some of my mentors. I did my final year thesis dissertation with a very famous scientist called Jake McMillan who worked on the biosynthesis of gibberellins which are plant hormones. Uh, he was a lovely guy, a very interesting Scottish uh, chemist and so that really introduced me to the whole idea of biosynthesis which again I was sort of interested in. I then went to do my PhD with Jack Baldwin, who was working on penicillin biosynthesis, which is, was world famous uh, research trying to understand how penicillin and cephalosporin antibiotics were biosynthetically assembled. And at that point, I changed direction slightly and went to work with George Whitesides at Harvard University. And so this is now 1985, when people are starting to get interested in using enzymes for synthesis rather than studying enzymes for mechanism or biosynthesis, which was very much the sort of 50s, 60s, 70s up to the 80s and is still a, a you know, very important field. But it, around about the mid-1980s, uh, people like Brian Jones at the University of Toronto, Charlie C at the University of Wisconsin, Stan Roberts at Glaxo in the UK, were, and George Whitesides obviously at Harvard University were starting to think about using enzymes in synthesis, which was slightly different and somewhat controversial, I would say. You know, people had studied enzymes for understanding a mechanism, but the idea to use enzymes as catalysts for synthesis um, wasn't really well developed in the mid-80s. It's now taken for granted. So that sort of that was my path, if you like, from natural history through to biocatalysis via chemistry, and uh, yeah, that's where I am now today. Now, about 30 years after the start of your research career, you run a large research laboratory as director of the Center of Excellence for Biocatalysis, Biotransformations, and Biocatalytic Manufacture in the UK. So as you look back on your research career so far, are there key events or milestones that stand out as particularly or personally meaningful in your mind? 
So Chris, I started my career in the late 1980s in, in biocatalysis. Now the world was a very different place then. We mainly used, and other people mainly used, wild type enzymes. So you could find them in microorganisms or you could purchase them from enzyme suppliers. In the late 80s, early 90s, papers started to appear in the literature, mainly from the groups of Francis Arnold, uh, Pim Stemmer, Manfred Reitz in um, Mulheim, where this idea of protein engineering and directed evolution um, started to look like a different way of developing enzymes for specific applications. I remember you know, those papers coming out in the literature, talking to my group, and you know, we were aware of the fact this was going to change the whole landscape of biocatalysis. The fact that you could take an enzyme from nature and evolve it to do something that it either didn't do or, or something it could do much better in terms of stability, activity, etc., was clearly going to have a major impact on the field. So we made a conscious decision in the late 80s to try to embrace this approach. And if I'm honest, we, were, we, we needed to sort of learn how to do it. I, I was very fortunate I got some funding from industry, from Glaxo again, who we had very good relationships with. They funded um, a couple of postdocs in my lab, and we started to learn how to make libraries, how to make libraries of DNA, libraries of enzymes, how to do high throughput screening, how to basically do protein engineering. And we got a little bit lucky. We worked on this enzyme that I talked about earlier, monoamine oxidase. And that turned out to be a very good choice for a first enzyme because it's quite an evolvable enzyme. So fairly quickly we found uh, variants of that enzyme that had really interesting substrate scope, completely different to the wild type. They're very active. We could use them in synthetic chemistry in very interesting ways. And we started to sort of join that community of protein engineers and uh, directed evolution scientists. So I would say that that was without doubt a major sort of inflection in terms of the research that we were doing. Uh, probably the next big move we made was when we went from Edinburgh University in 2004 to Manchester University in 2000, it, it, to Manchester University and for the first time we moved into an absolutely beautiful brand new purpose-built building, the Manchester, Manchester Institute of Biotechnology where I am at the moment and so this wasn't a lab that had to be refurbished, which is what we'd been used to. This was, these were purpose-built research laboratories for doing molecular biology, protein chemistry, uh, organic synthesis, biocatalysis. It's a beautiful building. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's, it's, it looks like a sort of biotech company. So that became really important in terms of recruiting students, collaborations. It's, it's a multidisciplinary institute, focuses entirely on research. So we don't really have undergraduates. So it led to new collaborations with colleagues in the building. And it's such a beautiful building that when you walk in there, you become sort of inspired. And, um, and, and so it's very nice for students. They, they, we, I, I noticed a sort of significant, I would say, sort of improvement in our ability to attract very good quality students. And, and the Center of Excellence in Biocatalysis was started in 2004 at the same time as we moved into the building and that has really gone from strength to strength. We use that as essentially a platform and a vehicle for collaborating with groups around the world, academic groups, industrial groups and th there's no doubt the, you know, the environment that we work in has, made a, has, has played a big role in our ability to, to do our research and to attract the, the, the people that you absolutely need to do this sort of work. Nick, thank you for sharing your thoughts and experiences working in biocatalysis and entomology with us. Both the ACS Division of Catalysis Science and Technology and the journal ACS Catalysis are excited to honor you as the 2018 winner of the ACS Catalysis Lectureship for the Advancement of Catalytic Science. I look forward to the symposium to be held in your honor at the ACS meeting this fall in Boston, where we can celebrate your contributions to catalysis and learn about your latest research. Thanks, Chris. Cheers. <laughs>